Welcome to the Crypto Podcast. You can find all our episodes on CryptoPodcast.org. We're also on BitChute and YouTube. You'll find the links in the podcast description. I have four other podcasts, the Awakening Podcast, Learn Polish Podcast, the Speaking, and the Meditation, as well as being a podcasting coach. And you can find them all on link.bio slash podcaster or roycon.com. Today, my guest in Nashville, Tennessee, please welcome Joe Ro- Ro- Rotella. Mm-hmm. Yep, you did good. Excellent. So welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Roy, for having me. I really appreciate it. No problem. See, we just let the listeners know. Who's Joe? Sure. So I am uh, I started off in graphic design. Um, I played music my whole life, and uh, or a lot of my life, and uh, slowly started to move into audio production, audio recording and stuff uh, with a graphic design background. It turned into like multimedia some video editing. Um, and then as audio became more of my thing, uh, slowly moved into podcasting and uh, grew with this whole podcasting thing that's this revolution of podcasting with how people now start to get their information. Um, so I started off with just doing basic music recording stuff. And then for like the last 10 years, just been slowly migrating into that podcast realm of stuff. And then now it's predominantly been um, audio editing, audio production for podcast stuff. Um, I work freelance with a couple different people. Uh, they got specialty tasks like that for multimedia stuff. They send it my way. And then um, during that course, um, it was probably about 2016, 2017. Uh, I was going through some hard times in my life. I was going through divorce and stuff and slowly got into crypto. Um, by just kind of looking up, seeing what was going on with it and decided to purchase some Bitcoin when it was at like 900 bucks. (laughs) And so I wasn't a lot. It wasn't because it was like one of those things where you're like, I don't know what I'm doing yet. So um, purchased a little bit of it, kind of sat with it for a year. And then um, as I, as there was a a year went by, I met one of my best friends now who um, he's an Air Force intelligence officer out here in the United States. And he was into crypto. And so randomly met him on this website where um, you kind of meet up with each other with people. For, it's called uh, meetup.com. And so we met up and we just randomly started talking about it. And all of a sudden we we're like, wait, you have crypto? You have crypto? So we started to um, really dive into it together um, in, a, in about 2017, 2018. And from there, it was just like, oh, I see the bigger picture of this thing. Like, this is a way bigger picture than, than people are understanding right now. Um, and then having all my background in audio production, stuff like that, um, realized that, especially in America, like, there's not a lot of people that are, like, really understanding it yet. And I love to, um, I'm not really necessarily about always making money for me. It's more like, how can I help? How can I educate people with stuff I know and make it simplified because I'm not gonna lie, like I'm not the smartest person in the room, um, but how can I take what I know about crypto and interpret it for other people and send it out and spread it out to the masses a- as simplified as possible. And podcasting was one of those outlets where it was like, I can use the information I know and, and send it out. And that's the easiest way to do it, which has led us to the crypto one or led me to the crypto one-on-one podcast, um, which is predominantly just educational based as much as I can be leaving my opinions out of it, but more or less giving people a foundation of what is this bigger picture that we need to understand because crypto is here to stay, whether any of us like it or not, but what's the bigger picture of it all. So anyway, I hope that sums it up. Oh, said- bro. Yeah, no, excellent. And just, just on the podcast, cause I've listened to a few episodes and you know, it's a, uh, cause like, obviously I'm interviewing people, but you're doing a solo a solo cast as such and you know you're talking how do you find that because i remember because i've got five podcasts as you know and i i just found it strange doing the solo cast how is it for you do you actually have it prepared down or are you just speaking from the heart on the topic that you're going for no that's a great question uh no if i went from like the just straight from my head oh it would be bad it would be terrible because i just i'm a random like i'll i'll like i'm doing right now just randomly saying stuff (laughs) Um, no, and honestly, like I, 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 I'm, I'm about 20, 20, I just released my 23rd episode yesterday and I, I, I've been hit up tons of times for interviews and it's not that I don't want to interview people. It's that 
my podcast isn't really about selling stuff necessarily. It's more about um, presenting information and helping people understand where it's coming from. And a lot of people that hit me up, they're great people, but like they want to try to sell something. And it's like, I, so I'm trying to slowly migrate, like having people like you on who have an understanding of it and trying to show people the bigger picture of it and where they started from and where, where they think it's going. I think that's more um, helpful to people so that it gives them a better critical thinking thought process on the whole thing. Um, so I try to do it, I, I do solo just by writing it. I like text, type it out before I ever say anything, reread it a bunch of times to make sure that it actually makes sense. Um, make sure that I'm fact checking a lot of stuff because like we all know, like there's a lot of information, especially with crypto that changes daily. Um, so it's, it's not, I don't find it hard doing the solo. It's more or less just not boring people with solo um, podcasting. So that's why my episodes are really short from like eight to 12 minutes long, because most people's attention spans are really short. <laughs> so. They're after switching off now already because we're after passing that. that yes, exactly. That eight minute. No, but I, I like that actually as well, because I think, you know, it's different, different, obviously, the conversation and we're, we're discussing something in specific, but like just to learn something information because you're not rattling off 50 things, you know, you're given each one as a certain topic. And I, I want to cover a few of them because I, I just like the way that you explained it. And like my reasoning behind doing the... The, the crypto podcast is I've got the awakening, which is exposing fraud and corruption. And I just saw in this industry with the rug pulls and with there are so many people out there that are ripping people off, which isn't doing us a favor in this technology because somebody gets burnt in something, they never want to touch it again. And I just thought by, you know, sharing information and I do the same, like I have on the form that people fill in. It's like, this isn't a pitch fest. Like, you know, I have no problem. Right, you right, know, people right. like, you know, that they, you have a service and that's ground. But like, I didn't want the case that somebody's coming in and they're launching a new coin. And they go, oh yeah, let's let's go on to him and start doing it, you know. And I, like my my first video has actually mentioned that even if I have somebody on the show and they're actually talking, you still do your own due diligence. And I yes. know that I know you. I don't do that, but I know you. You actually give a disclaimer at the start of your podcast, and yeah, I, I understand that as well. Like you're kind of saying even the information that you use, and I mean you you mentioned that you're fact checking it, but you're just ring fencing it as well because unfortunately we're we're living in a world that everybody wants to sue you, like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much so. And, and it's crazy because people, um, yeah, well, and everything's out there permanently now, too. So that's a whole nother aspect of it. So it's, it's, a scary I didn't time. realize because it was something I saw not so long ago where you can do backtracker or something. Like that. I was able to check a business that I had over I don't know, 12 years ago or something like that. And I was looking at the website and because I used to do a load of property and I was able to see everything. And I was like, whoa, you know, and my newsletter and the whole lot was like, yeah, I didn't realize that. And it's like, it's good in a way, but it's also scary because, yeah, you know, people make mistakes in life and it's like, it, yes. it, co it comes back to bite them and people, like, I think that's why sometimes when people do something like, some of the evil boys doing some bad things it can be good for us as well because people are able to actually grab it and you know they can share what was was actually done you know yes. and post it. yes exactly exactly so i know you talk about uh web 3.0 so you might because i know you you actually done a show on that and you're talking about kind of you know the the development from one upwards you might just talk a bit on that just to let people know about it yeah, sure. So the, the last podcast I just did was on Web3. And um, basically, we had Web1, which was like static web pages, hyperlinks, like the first of the first of internet, like dial up. And then we moved to Web2.0, which was more like our Facebook, Amazon, um, eBay, you know, the, the social medias, the e-commerce based, uh, more, more user interface and big data collection. That was Web2. That's Web2.0, what we're pretty much in right now. And then web three is, which it's, I want to say it like it, it hasn't really been determined yet because it's still evolving, but it's going to be heavily based probably in blockchain, which is have, like crypto heavy, you know, is predominantly relied on. And we're talking like the integration of AI meeting, um, you know, it, it, there was a really good tweet. I, I forgot his name now that did it. I said it in the podcast episode. But it was basically web, web one was read only. Web two was read and write only. Web three is going to be read, write, and own 
only, where you're going to own your data back again. And that's where predominantly it sounds like a lot of people are pushing because a lot of people are tired of the big data collection of their information. That's the beauty of blockchain. You know, that's that's the beauty. I've always said, like, people always think that I drink Kool-Aid with cryptocurrency. It's like, I'm not for nor against crypto. Um, it's more or less that, like, I there's a bigger picture here. And, and blockchain is the underlying technology that can be completely amazing if we allow it to be. And great use cases for it. I There's a couple, and I, I don't mean to go off on a tangent, but no, there's... No, it's, it's um, all about, yeah. With, with blockchain, the use cases, as a musician and an artist, there's a lot of people that are against NFTs. I understand why the whole image side of things, it's stupid. But if you take a step back, this is where like my podcast, I want to try to teach critical thinking to people where it's like, okay, it's okay to be criti like critical of the image side. Ticketmaster. It's, I don't know how it is where, like, like in Poland, yeah. but yeah, Ticketmaster ticket is there as well. Yeah. It's, it's predominant and it's annoying. It's their ticketing fees are outrageous. They, they, it's all of it. It's too expensive. Blockchain could potentially eliminate the middleman fees of that on top of smart contracts, which would directly pay artists, which would directly pay, you're cutting out a, a whole section, which would not only drop costs, but also give more money to artists and the people that are actually contributing to the entertainment side of things. And stop um, the scammers as well, because the ticket sales, they're, they're I mean, it is a horrible thing. Imagine traveling to get a ticket and you queue up and you have to pay in the money. Yeah, yeah. it stops that, that. I think that's brilliant when I heard that. I was like, that, that is that's, so fantastic. That's exactly, exactly it. It's And so like get get that protocol is, or get, get protocol that IO is actually doing. And I'm not, I don't work with them or anything. The only reason I bring them up is it's an example of a use case, like ticketing system for, for artists and bands and musicians and venues. They are doing that. They're starting to evolve. And especially it's happening in Europe where they're creating this alternate ticketing system that puts more money into artists. So the only reason I go off on that tangent is because blockchain allows that to happen. That's a blockchain use case in NFT world where people are actually getting a digital um, digital file on the blockchain, like you said, that prevents fraud. It gives them actually what they're doing. And again, trying to get the majority of the population in, on top of this is very difficult. But as people spread the awareness of it, it's like, guys, this is really good technology that could potentially be awesome. Not saying it, it, it's it's not a utopia, but it's getting to a better point of where user data is is not shared with everybody. You know, you're saving money. It's middleman being eliminated from all the junk that we get tired of, all that stuff. So um, Web three allows all that integration to come into play if it's if it's done somewhat correctly, um, which again that falls on a lot of big names to want to do stuff like that where i don't see google wanting to give up collecting data yeah. or yeah. facebook it seems like that's what drives them that's just my opinion but um anyway that's kind of the evolution of web 3.0 though is is basically you will own your data and as somebody who um and again i try really hard to keep my opinion out of all this stuff but like why wouldn't I want to be accountable for my own data? Like, why would I not want to own my own? And that's where cryptocurrency comes in. You are your bank. You own your, your coins, your tokens. And it's teaching people that, to be accountable, to be like, you should want that. You should want to know what these tokens do. Why are you investing in a Shiba coin if there's no good use case to it? So it's trying to teach people that. Like, you have the power to do this. You have the power to understand it here you go, you know? So that's kind of where web 3.0 for me is driving, which again, this could take a decade or two to get to, but it's cool that we're seeing this and we are in the front lines of it right now. And I think that's important. So anyway, I didn't mean to ramble no, on that. No, one, no, but... it's fine. no, it's excellent. And uh, like regarding you know, your data, I mean, like with any of my websites, I don't use the cookies or anything because I, right. you know, I, I kind of say, hey, practice what you preach. If you're against this, don't, you know, don't have this. So I make sure any of yes. my businesses, I do not have cookies. And I hate, like you go in, a lot of the time it's like reject them 
And sometimes you, you've no choice. It, it yes. just goes. And uh, I done a search. There was some, I don't know, some video or something I've seen telling you how to check what Google had on you. And it was frightening. Like they, yes. they know so much. You can turn it off. But I mean, yeah, it's even now the phone next to us is recording. You know, it's like, do we agree to yeah. that? Of course not. Do we have a choice? No. And like regarding the NFTs, I mean, I'm actually working now. I've got a team doing um, like digital art. And I, I love that because I, I, I saw that it was based on a guest. I saw a guest coming on explaining and I just, I just got it. I went, this is beautiful because even with normal art, there's so much copies. I mean, there's people even in yeah. museums, they think they're original this way. We create something beautiful. We're going to add music to it and you buy it. And whether you sell one of 200 or a one of one, you're getting something unique. And the beauty is with art, some people like, like something all their life. Others, they like to change things around in three months. And the beauty is, you can change it around and you can even sell the one that you had. And what I like as well, um, actually, it might be something to discuss is I see like uh, OpenSea is the main one for that. And you can build in a commission. So I think 10% is a fair enough. I know you can modify. But what I've read is that when you take it off that platform, so if somebody actually takes it off and sells it on to another, then the, the royalties don't work. Is the, like that's, that's a bit kind of concerning because if you agree on a contract and you, you're kind of looking after the artist as well as the team that have put it together, is, do you think that's something that can be resolved or have you any ideas on what's going that's on there? A, that's a great question. Um, and that's where, because it's funny, a lot of people say bring that stuff up. They're like, how, how like, when it comes to the smart contract stuff, and, and I know somewhat about smart contracts because a lot of like real estate is starting to go into that realm. And some of some of the, even the music industry is starting to use smart contracts with selling stuff. Um, that's a good question. I'm not completely sure how that would be eliminated just because, because I it, either way, it's on a blockchain. So you're still seeing what the actual, it, with the data of it itself, it's not, a, it, it's, it's showing that there's a timestamp for that specific um, uh, exchange or whatever. I don't know how you would prevent necessarily to do that, but like you bringing up the NFTs too, with the whole, whole like art side of things, just in music alone, as somebody who tries to sell his music and stuff, like you're talking eliminating Napster with nfts because those are timestamp and unique and and that's another thing like i have a lot of musician friends who are like nfts are stupid this is the and i'm sitting here like you're missing the bigger picture like you can take your songs now post them to a spotify type platform and people purchase them but they can't copy them or duplicate them and they have a unique encrypted that can't be exchanged unless they try, unless they should decide to sell it through the blockchain again. And I don't think they understand that. Like, that's a good and, thing. And, and good luck with getting paid from Spotify. You know? <laughs> I, I, yes. Like, th at least you're working out the agreement of the smart contract of what you can actually be paid. You know what I mean? There's Snoop Dogg is kind of doing something with that too, where this, he's building a platform based on that. And again, I, I'm not trying to go off on tangents, but it's, it's trying to, to give people a better understanding of it's not a utopia, but it is really good stuff that could potentially be game changers in a good way for everybody involved, you know, and so I don't know, but, but to answer your question, I'm not quite sure how they would eliminate somebody pulling it off of that, except requiring it to be on that blockchain specific, specifically. I, I don't know though. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I know blockchain, but I don't know the ins and outs as yeah, well. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. so advanced that it's crazy how it all works. But it's, it's especially with like the NFTs. And like I said, because you mentioned Snoop Dogg, because I saw that somebody had created something with him, an NFT, but it wasn't done by him. So like we have to kind of look down the copyright rule as well. No, like because he hasn't said anything about it. But in reality, it's really been it's getting his value because of who he is. And I know that with T-shirts and everything over the years, there's been something yeah. similar like i don't know has trump got anything to do with the ones that were sold i don't know did they have one of ten thousand or one of ton a thousand they're basically just the gra i don't know did you see that the graphic they're like beavis and butthead kind of <laughs> you know it's really poor and it's like changing the hat he's got a patch on just like and they're selling for two thousand seven hundred and fifty or mid yeah. the lowest was 500 loads of them sold and i'm like that would probably take a good guy 15 minutes to change them <laughs> you know, yes it's it's crazy um it, actually it's funny you bring up too with like 
I've gotten so many questions with the NFT, like after I did the NFT podcast, I've gotten questions about like, okay, so like starting with the ownership, which maybe you can answer this too. Um, they, they basically asked me the question of, okay, so you put, let's say you, cr I create a song and, or, or a digital art piece and I put it on the blockchain and somebody's like, well, how do I still know that you're the verified owner of that and you didn't take it from somebody else? And I had to answer it with, well, do you know the Mona Lisa was originally created by, Yada? you know, like, how, how do you know, like, you, they're trying to make a, a negative stance immediate, and you're like, well, that's for any piece of art, like, that's the courts to decide, you have to take, that's where the original creation has to be displayed by the original files. So, do you get what I, like, yeah, yeah, they're I asking that question. And I mean, like, yeah, because at the end of the day, here, like when it's promoted and everything the information of the person that's actually stating it so if it was me and you buy it off me but i'm saying i'm the owner of this and then you buy it, i i think it comes back to me to be honest with you because i'm the, you're the original creator because you've you you've bought it on good merit i and i've been like if i wasn't the original creator if i dropped it from somebody without saying nothing like you know because i'm i i because you can trace it back i would say that i would be the liable one because I didn't, you know, I wasn't ethical in, in, yes. in my dealings. Eh? But, but those are the questions we get with all this stuff. And it's, it's like that intense, like trying to teach people all this Web3, like this NFTs, all this stuff. And, and a lot of, you know, I'm 40, I'm going to be 41 next month. And a lot of people that are older than me, in my family even, are, you know, so stuck and not like, I don't want to change it. And it's like, it doesn't matter whether we want to change or not. This web three is coming, whether we like it or not. It just depends on how it all evolves. And the other thing with web three, not to, to piggyback back off that is we may need new types of cell phones to be able to, to, to like do all this web three stuff. Like you're talking, there's all this change. That's why it's potential. It could take a decade or two before any of it actually is implemented at all, you know, but, but it's awesome to see we are slowly moving progress and maybe it was Edward Snowden showing that like the data collection was a dangerous thing, but this is all leading to something, a bigger perspective of owning our own data and, and allowing us to be the masters of our own data. So I think that's ultimately where web three is moving to, which I hope it does, because I think for you and I both, it's kind of like, yeah, I don't really like all these companies selling my data and then I'm getting these, you know, these marketing spam, all this stuff. And that's, I think, a lot too, to go with a lot of people with crypto are nervous about all the fraudulent fraud and all this stuff. And it, I think they miss, they misidentify what the actual fraud is versus like, like what current fraud is, if, if that makes sense. Like the current fraud of like spamming and all that stuff where I think crypto is different with how the fraud works. It's more of a, black market, you know, like where that stuff happens. And it's really not as big as people think though. Like it's, Chainalysis did a, uh, 2020, they did a thing about it. And it was only three point, I think it was like 3.1% of crypto was actually used in the black market. And the predominant coin was, um, was, uh, Moreno, uh, was it Moreno? I think was the was the top coin that was used as fraud because it's really the most non-trackable coin. But they said that most criminals don't use it because they still don't understand crypto, that they're still using US dollars as fraud, like as anyway. That's where it's like web three, everybody's like gotta start understanding that there's bigger pictures here and 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 it's going in a direction whether we like it or not and it's trying to eliminate a lot of that stuff from happening so excellent when when you're looking at new coins because i think there's something like eight thousand now at this stage and yeah you know we've heard that the rug pulls and everything but, but like what would you advise somebody that's kind of looking at like what kind of systems of you that you kind of sure. go this isn't uh, going to be a rug pull Sure. Um, so I don't ever, and you know this too, like you stated before, like I don't, I don't give financial advice. The way I process getting a coin, which I'm, I'm more of a Bitcoin purist just because of the original, but I do own a couple little coins, small coins, not a ton of them. Um, 
when I look for stuff, it's specifically, what does the white paper say? The white paper is basically the outline of what each coin is doing. The biggest thing is the use case. Like, what is the ultimate use case for this coin or token? Meaning like, why are we using it? What's the, what's, what's, why are we purchasing it? What's the end goal for it to be used for? Is it just me to, you know, store in a vault? Is it just because it's named Shiba? Is it just because it's named some random coin? You know, because a lot of people just go based off of a name and it's like, you can do that. That's your prerogative. But I would highly suggest against it because most of the time you, it's so volatile, you're going to miss out on these leaps. So usually it's the white papers, the use case. Um, what, like if everybody's piling into it, it's, it's probably speculative. So I would be very hesitant with it. If Elon Musk is sitting here saying it's going to go to the moon, I would be very cautious with that because most of the time when investors are speculative like that, they're probably already bought into it and they're going to sell when it's really high. So you probably already missed the boat. Those are usually my three indicators of like, if I'm going to purchase a coin, but the predominant one is the use case. So like, if I see a value to it, where it's like, oh, this is, this looks like it's got a lot of potential. The other thing too, is people, you can do the short term if you want, like, that's totally fine. I learned how to swing trade back during the pandemic. And it taught me that I know very little about how to time markets because it is unpredictable, even, the, you know, and so I'm not telling people not to hold on to coins short term, but for me personally, it's like find a use case that you know is going to last a long time because that will predominantly grow over time. That's top investors usually do that. It's, you know, you, you hold for a while, um, but use cases are generally the biggest one, the white paper, and also seeing what the team that's behind it is actually doing with it. Do they have other coins or tokens that they built that were successful? Do they, um, what's their end game? Where are they looking at for this coin to move to? Is it's, There's a lot to do with that. So that's predominantly what, like if people ask me, like, again, I don't give financial advice, but that's where I'm looking if I'm trying to see what I'm putting my money into, into cryptocurrency. Okay. And with proof of work and proof of stake, and we talk about that and also the, the, so-called change with ethereum when there's supposed to be the proof of stake coming i don't know when it's coming but yeah i don't um sorry what, go ahead what, what like you... Uh, you might explain to people that it, like uh, if it's only proof is there coins that have just proof of stake or have is it a case of both yeah majority of coins will just be one or the other they won't um they, they really won't be both because it's too tricky to to, to do that. Um, and, sh and, and you have like, they'll do like Bitcoin has forks or like they'll have, you know, like a hard fork or a soft fork where it's basically like they take it and they, and they, it's not, it, there's still the original Bitcoin, but then somebody branches off the blockchain to be a different, a diff like there's Bitcoin cash or whatever it is, which again, I don't, I don't know much about it just because I, I stick with the original but like Bitcoin cash might be proof of work or whatever. And then they branch off another thing and it's proof of stake, you know, um, like who, who creates this? I mean, does somebody just decide, yeah, I'm going to do this. And then they own all this and they become billionaires overnight. Well, it's yes. So like there's, there's teams of developers that'll get into this, that'll get involved in it and they'll see some other type of use case for it. And that's where they start to do a fork for like, well, we want to change, um, we want to, so like there's rules with, with blockchain and they're called protocols and those protocols are what make the blockchain secure. So like blockchain has its protocols, but if they want to change that protocol, either a, everybody that's a part of Bitcoin has to accept that that's called consensus on the blockchain where everybody has to agree to it. If it doesn't, they can still fork off and make a new protocol that'll make this new type of token or coin. This is where a lot of people are like, oh, this is all BS because people are, which I'm not disagreeing, but that's why you have to look at the use cases of those new tokens and coins being built. A lot of people get annoyed with me with this, but I would say like 95 to 98% of cryptocurrency is BS. 
There is 2% of cryptocurrency that is legit a game changer. A lot of pure crypto heads get really annoyed with me saying that. But the truth of the matter is it's like you have people that are just like get rich quick and get out. And they do. And they fall, and there's a lot of people that fall for it, which is why I created the crypto one-on-one -on -one show is like, don't fall for that. That's the stuff like there is sure maybe a percentage of people get rich quick off of selling a coin. You and I aren't going to be those people. Like you really got to stay to a computer 24 seven to be able to time that or, you know, so when people fork those off, yeah, like it's usually developers, teams of groups of people that want to build something. And most of the time it's on Ethereum's blockchain that they're doing that, um, which again, Ethereum is like the leader in DeFi apps when it comes to building these things, which is not a bad thing. It's, it's good, but it can be bad because you get, you know, this is where um, we get accountability. Cryptocurrency makes people have to be accountable and actually pay attention to what they're buying. And I think that to me is a good thing. And that's why it's important to understand when a thing, when something hard forks or soft forks or read the white paper, read the use case of it, see what it actually entitles before you start buying it. I cannot tell you how many people are like, well, I bought Bitcoin, but they bought like some other offshoot of Bitcoin. It's like, that's not Bitcoin. Read the use case, read the white paper, it, to see exactly what you're buying before you actually do this, because there is a lot of, developer teams that do that and people pour their money in and then the coin drops down and it's like so that's where it gets confusing for people to understand but that's why like you know with crypto it's a big it's a big market there's a big big picture and it's a lot of information to understand so anyway i, I kind of hope that answered the question yeah, no, definitely. Between... yeah 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 and just um, just on like wallets and exchanges, then what's uh, which, I mean, I know you don't like recommending something, but no. you know, <laughs> um, I always recommend for beginners. I know a lot of, a lot of people that have been around for a while hate, um, that I recommend it. But the reason I do is because it's user interface is really easy is Coinbase to get started in crypto. Coinbase has a really user-friendly interface for beginners. Once you get a grasp of it, by all means, move to Binance, move to any other exchange you want, Kraken, whatever it is. And not every exchange has every coin. So you have to remember that too. Um, like PancakeSwap has certain, certain coins that you might want to purchase through it. Not a big deal. You have to, you know, obviously get an account through there, go through that whole exchange to get the coins you want. And then my rule of thumb, um, not your key, not your coin. What does that mean? That's predominant in the cryptocurrency uh, realm. It basically means if you, if you purchase a coin on, on Coinbase on an exchange, you're going to want to pull it off that exchange. The blockchain is really secure. Most Bitcoin's blockchain hasn't been hacked yet. It, it, and there's a reason for it. And that's a lot of information to give people. But pretty much the exchanges can get hacked. The exchanges aren't blockchains. So you're going to want to pull any coins that you do off of the exchange and put it onto what we call a, a cold wallet. Cold wallet, you remove off of your computer. You, it's like a USB stick. You put your your yeah, your ledger. cryptocurrency. Yeah, you have exactly. Yeah, I have. Is that a ledger? Yeah. Yeah, I have a digital ledger too. I put it in a safe in in, in my house. Lock it up. Store it. When I buy new crypto, I put it back into there. Transfer it over from the exchange. And I bring it back off of it. Why do we, why do you do it? What's the reason you you put it on cold storage? Same thing, you know, because like I mean, Mount Gox is it that was going back about in yeah. the 2010? <laughs> but like, because I've heard about that, I watched the, the documentary about it, and I was like, ooh, you know, and it's basically what you said there. Like, it's a, it's a, it's not on an exchange. It's not yours. Like, you know, it's great. I mean, I mean, to have a small amount. Yeah, yes. play, playing around, of course, you don't want to be because, yeah, it, it is a bit of work. You know, you're putting in the code and just for those that don't know, like you, you create a code and you're doing so you're kind of acknowledging everything that you do when you do it. But at the same time, you know, when you get a certain amount, you, you don't want to be risking it. You put it away. And like the beauty is if you're if you're a nomad, I think it's ideal because you can travel yeah. around the place and yeah, you don't have to deal with this. Oh, yeah, you, you're only allowed 10,000, you know. 
Yes. Yeah. And, and that's, and that, so that it's funny you bring that up because th those exchanges get hacked. Coinbase has been hacked before. Um, and that's the other thing with cryptocurrency. This is not backed by the FDIC. Like, so, and that, I don't know if that's where in Europe and stuff, but in, in America, the FDIC basically insures a certain amount of money in your bank account. Um, like, I think it's like $250,000 before. It, so if like somebody comes in and steals money out of your account or whatever, the FDIC will cover 250,000. It's a hundred thousand there. And I always think, good luck getting it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they, they just tell you that to make you feel good. I don't think you're ever gonna- You're ever gonna, it. yes. And, and that, so with cryptocurrency, with the exchanges, they don't, they do not insure. So like if you leave stuff on the exchange and that exchange gets hacked, Say goodbye to it. Most of the time, you do not get that currency back. There are a few hacks that have been, and they do get the currency back from the hacker or whatever it is. Um, but that's where getting, so you have the ledger, just like I do, you put it in, it's cold storage. Hot storage is basically anything that's connected to the internet. So you can have a hot storage wallet, something like Electrum or whatever. I used to have Electrum. Um, and you put it on, your, on a wallet on your desktop. It's a little more secure than Coinbase, but if somebody hacks your computer, they could still get into that hot wallet. And especially if you leave the keys on your computer, which means like the digital codes, if you put them in a document and they find that document, they can steal your, your crypto still. So it's always best to move it off of there. But like you said, if you're doing small amounts, by all means, you could keep it on exchange like to learn how to do it and stuff. But it's when you get more and more like advanced and you're getting bigger chunks of the crypto, I would highly recommend investing in a hundred dollar ledger for peace of mind, pulling it off and not have to worry about it. And, and the other thing with those hot or with the cold wallets, a lot of stores allow you to use those now to, to buy and to buy, to buy goods and services with it. They have USB readers that will take crypto for you. So it's, it's evolving into web three. It's just slowly going into there. So that's true. Brilliant, brilliant. And, uh, just uh, just fine and to be honest i'd love to get you back because i what i want to do is i'm listening to your shows and get you back covering the different things because I, I think you have a great way of explaining it so the mining have you touched on mining at all or what's your thoughts on that so i have not touched on mining i actually did an interview with another podcast that he's doing this and, and he was in um he was in england and he he's got a whole company that builds mining computers and does mining stuff i i am not a logic thinker and for mining it's like i know with algorithms you know they're solving these complex algorithms to build these coins because that's another thing people get really confused with is like what are the miners doing well they're the ones that obviously mine out the coins by their supercomputers that are pulling out these giant algorithms to produce these coins for us you know portions of these coins and then they sell them to us and that's why we pay a miner's fee when we do when we do purchase cryptocurrency we have to pay for a miner's fee that they get a cut of it or whatever and it just depends on the coin exchange that they have the agreement with on what the actual fee is um but i i have not touched up much on mining i know a, a few of my friends have started to slowly get into it and it was they were making money but their electric bills were outrageously expensive so it was like you know, it's, it's one of those things, but I, I, I haven't touched too much into mining just because the complexity of building a computer like that. And, and also the shortage of compute computer chips have led me to not actually look too much into it just because I'm like, there's just no way. I think, no I think the timing is important because at one stage, you know, when it was becoming very popular, it was too late. Then it just kind of dropped. People bought all the processors and everything and they knew what they were doing. Because I, like I know people are taking the parts out of the computers, reselling the other, the, the rest of the computer and they're making good money. Like I know one guy that, that I know and he was getting a return in four months and he said on a bad, Whoa. yeah, on a bad situation, it was a year. But I know that can all change. And I think it's too late now again. I think it's like the costs have gone up so much that it doesn't justify doing it. And you just need to be watching the market and looking at the different types. Yes. I would totally agree with you. That that's exact, and it, and it's one of those where it's like you got to really you got to know how to build the computer. You got to know how to do the ins and outs of it. And I'm not, I'm tech savvy, but I'm not enough to like. And and I do I should do a podcast on mining. I 
just because it would be a good one for people to understand. Um, it's one of those where it's like the uh, like coding, you know, like how people are like, I don't understand coding, but it's still a good grasp to understand the language behind it, how it all operates and works. But I totally agree with you. It, it seems like with, with the market, with the computer chips and all that stuff, it's like, it's crazy expensive to get involved in it. And, and again, if people want to, they can. I just am like, I couldn't afford it. And I don't want my electric bill going, <laughs> going crazy, especially out here right now. It's, it's, it's getting kind of costly. Uh, yeah, I, I reckon what's happened around the world, that yeah. a, lot of, a lot of people were awake, making money and then all of a sudden it actually went to negative. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Listen, Joseph, totally enjoyed our conversation. You might let people know how they can get in contact with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you ever, if anybody wants to listen to the show, it's uh, the Crypto One on One Show. You can find it on any major streaming platform: Spotify, Apple, Amazon, um, Stitcher. All of them have it on there. Um, I, if anybody ever personally wants to get in touch with me, it's the WildOneMedia.com. It's T H E, the number one um, Wild. So it's Wild One, number one Media.com. And um, yeah, they're more than welcome to get in touch with me. If, I'm always open to suggestions too for for show ideas. Uh, questions for people. I get questions all the time. I love getting them because that lets me know what the audience wants to hear about. And that helps me because some of the stuff I don't know, and then it helps me have to investigate, figure it out and put it down as simplified as possible for people to understand. So anybody has questions, please feel free to shoot them to me. I would totally be happy to answer them. Oh, brilliant. And I'll make sure I put the links both on the audio and the video. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So for the, the crypto podcast, you'll find all our episodes on cryptopodcast.org or on BitChute and YouTube. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five star rating, subscribe. Until next week, take care.